Hi there guys, welcome to issue 26. So today we've got some terrific terrain and some good news for people who have Warcry, at least the starter set, and thought they were just going to be doubling up on the same terrain. But we'll get to that when we come to the build guide. I've already assembled this week's terrain, but we'll talk about that more when we get there. So what have we got today? We've got Azerite Ruins, Discover the Sylvaneth, and then a movement tutorial. Now, it's fitting that we've got Discover the Sylvaneth in this because for those of you subscribing pre for premium online, at least in the UK, I'm not sure exactly where premium is available. So I know that now that Mortal Realms has launched in Australia, I know that they are not getting that premium content. But for those of us who are, in this delivery, it says issues uh, 23 to 26, you get premium content number two, which is the Sylvaneth. Now, I, as well as collecting from my local shop, I also have a premium subscription. But Hachette somehow managed to cock it up this um, this time around. And for some reason this month, they sent me my, miss, my missing paint palette, a uh, palette pad from last month. And they sent me a set of brushes, which apparently were due this month. They sent me another set of brushes, and I don't know why. And they didn't send me any magazines. So I don't know exactly what's happened this uh, for this month. So, and I know at least one other person has got exactly the same issues. So they got all the extra stuff and all the different things. But they didn't get the magazines as well as premium content number two. But I'm dealing with Hachette and hope, hopefully we'll get that stuff soon. And I will bring that video for premium content to sooner rather than later. So let's see what we've got in this issue. Dive deep into the forests of the realm of life as you explore the ancient, ancient Azerite ruin that comes with this issue. Before the age of chaos, many great civilizations existed and their ruins now span the realms, having been destroyed by invading chaos forces long ago. Your new scenery kit will allow you to build your own such ruin and use it in your games. To do that, we have included build and paint guides in this issue. There's also a tutorial on how to move over and around it in your games since you'll be fighting over it in this issue's exciting battle plan okay great so what have we got Stormhost part six um information on the sylvaneth the fate of the fire fang tempest laws defend against the blades of corn in akshi build guide paint guide movement phase tutorial this tutorial explains how to move your models using visual examples then we've got War Scrolls for Evocators. Now, I might be annoying some people because I don't know if it's right. Is it Evocators or Evocators? So is it capital E or small e? Evocators or Evocators? Please let me know and I'll try and change that because I'm sure that I say things wrong and I'd probably get it wrong right through the run. I'd get it wrong right through to issue 80 unless someone tells me. So if I ever get anything like that wrong, please correct me in the comments. Then we've got Dreadside Herodons. This is all the rules you need to, to use Dreadside Herodons in your game. So I'm assuming that's the War Scroll. And I've got Lifting the Curse. Xandria Azure Bolts and her retinue delve deep in the forest to lift the Briar Queen's curse from ancient ruins. Okay, brilliant. So, Stormhosts Part 6. May Stormhosts have attracted mortal followers to their cause, either through their heroic actions or their ability to inspire the downtrodden. The Tempest Lords, for instance, are inspirational speakers and they're capable of rousing entire armies of fanatical mortals to war in the name of Sigmar. Though they never speak, the silent hosts fight with such might and fury that they have also inspired their mortals to take up arms against the predatory forces of chaos. So those are the Tempest Lords and these ones are the silent host. We've also got Astral Templars the Helden Sons and Sons of the Storm. Okay, so we've got a little bit of information here, shoulder and shield. The Tempest Lords do not hail from the first forging and therefore bear the wielded, the wielded hammer upon their shields and shoulders. This symbol represents the warrior, the warrior defiant. Okay, cool. And that moves on to more stuff about mortals 
in this realm. The Tempest Lords are descended from a line of heroic nobles. They are masterful tacticians, accomplished warriors and inspirational speakers. They create a righteous fury in the mortals who fight alongside them and often accompanied to war by many such fanatics. Okay, <clears throat> good. Okay, so now we've got the Sylvaneth part one. The Sylvaneth are the children of Ariel, the Ever Queen. They are woodland spirits who share Sigmar's hatred for the forces of chaos. They are a force to be feared even amongst other races of order. For many who enter the dark groves in which they make their homes never return. Okay, so the wrathful force of nature, the Sylvaneth, despise those who seek to corrupt the natural order of mortal realms. The towering spirits of Dorthu are amongst the most deadly of Ariel's children, capable of cleaving apart entire armies with their colossal blades. Okay, the spirit song. All the children of Ariel are connected to each other by the spirit song. No matter how far from Gairan each or each other they are, they remain linked by this haunting melody that flows through them. The energies of the spirit song allow the Sylvaneth to live and fight as one people, regardless of their differences. The colossal giants known as the Tree Lords act as amplifiers for the spirit song, strengthening its call. When the time for battle comes, they can rally their kin by singing the song of war. The, strange of the, the strangest of the Sylvaneth are the outcasts, bitter, rage fueled spirits who have been exiled by their own goddess. These fell creatures are, um, are almost completely cut off from the spirit song, but they still hear the song of war. They will come to the aid of their kin when they hear this call to violence. Okay, very cool. Okay, next we've got the fate of the fire fang. From the swirling demonic depths of the Clavis Rift, Korn's followers and their demon allies strike out towards the fire fang. Total slaughter, their objective. Only the Tempest Lords stand in their way. Desi and Calathar stood atop the ash-covered ridge made of volcanic stone. His retinue at his side staring out over the magma fields beyond them. The waters of Ripplegast Sound were lit red by volcanic activity, illuminating several crude boats full of cornate warriors. Their foes intended to land upon the fiery beach. They would not be allowed to take the ridge. The Firefang lies near the Clavis Rift and the hellish portal known as the Eye. From this location, the forces of Khorne have launched many attacks upon nearby bastions of order. Okay. Okay, very good. Now, we've got how to build Azerite's ruins. Now, I've already built mine. It's a very, very simple one-page guide. So what we get is we get one small piece of floor terrain, which is nice. We get one small wall, which is also very nice. And then we get one large, or sorry, semi-large piece of terrain. which is a really cool piece. Now, last week I said that this is not the terrain from Warcry. And sure enough, if you own Warcry and you build up the terrain as per that guide, you will not receive this piece. It will not be there. However, this is from a Warcry sprue. It's just that the way that the Mortal Realms magazine tells you to build it, you end up with something from that you don't have from Warcry. So that that makes me really, really happy. Just because I already have Warcry, and it means that I can add to my terrain, but I'm not having a duplicate. Yes, you get this with Warcry. You get a couple of these, and you get a couple of these, and that's great. But it means we can add another large piece of terrain, which doesn't duplicate anything that we already have in Warcry, even though it's the same sprue. In fact, silly me, I forgot to take out that bit. Is there anything else I missed? Hmm, that looks like it, yeah. Forgot to clip out that bit there. Okay, but yeah, that's a fantastic piece of terrain. I really, really like that. I really like this much more than the other stuff that we've had, the uh, 
corpse rack mausoleum. I love this stuff. Really, really cool. Okay, then we've got paint guide. So what do we get to? We are Corax white all over. Then we're Agrax earth shade all over. Then we're dry brushing all over it looks like. Then we are, so dry brushing with Corax white all over. Then we are Mechanicus standard gray on all of the brickwork. Then we are Corax white dry brush over that. Then we are Agrax earth shade over that. And that's what it will look like by the end of you painting it. I won't be painting it like this. I'll be painting it to match my other Warcry stuff, um, which is the same as the paint guide that Duncan did last year for that stuff. Right, okay. Now, movement phase tutorial. So what have we got? In this tutorial, visual examples explain the basics of movement in games of Warhammer Age of Sigmar. The examples are particularly important for moving over and around terrain features, so make sure you check them if you have any questions when playing a battle plan with terrain models. Okay, so basic movement. Each model in Age of Sigmar has a move characteristic. This value is listed on the unit's war scroll. A unit may only move this many inches unless they, are, unless they choose to run. The distance a model moves is measured using the part of the model's base that moves furthest from its starting position. So you can see in this, I know that this is stuff that we've been doing for ages, but you can just see in this bit of information here, it measures from the front of the base to the front of the base. It's a five inch movement. Okay, now it's got, in fact, let's do away with some of this stuff. Then we've got change direction. Models need not always move in a straight line when moving. To move around terrain, you may need to change direction during the move. To do this, measure each stage of the move separately. As long as the model has enough movement left, it can change direction multiple times during the course of a single move. And that, sure enough, that's got a five inch move that goes from there around the terrain. So just following that line, just measure it like that. It's got a little bit about unit cohesion. All models must remain within one inch horizontally and six inch vertically of at least one other model from their unit. If a unit is split up at the end of a turn, models must be removed from that unit until only a single group of models remains in play. Okay, so for example, we've got horizontally here, so everything's within an inch there. Sorry. So we've got there, horizontally, everything is within an inch. So that's in cohesion, except for that one who is out. And it's got some information there about vertical cohesion. So the bases are next to each other, but there's six inch vertical distance. As long as it's less than six inches, that is still in cohesion. OK, so that's all really, really cool stuff. And here we go. We've got some information here about movement and terrain specifically. The addition of terrain to your games provides a fully three dimensional battlefield for you to fight over. Here are some examples of how to move units across, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so moving onto terrain. So we've got this liberator here, and he's moving on top of, on top of uh, this piece of terrain. So he has to move towards the base, count the distance up, and then continues movement there. So he uses movement there, moves up three inches, so that's still part of his movement, and then continues his movement till he gets onto there. Whereas the prosecutor, who can fly, he only counts the horizontal difference. So the ground distance covered, he can, doesn't matter how high or low he goes, he can do that. So the vertical is ignored. Same for moving past terrain. So with this small terrain piece here, the prosecutor flies straight over, so it only counts the horizontal distance. So this is a one inch high terrain. So this, libera um, this liberator will move one inch up and then one inch down when he gets over. So that's that. And then movement through terrain. Some terrain features have gaps that can be moved through. A model's base must be able to fit through any gaps in the terrain in order to pass through. If it cannot fit, the model, the model must climb over or go around the feature. So it shows here, for example, these liberators can go straight through the gate of the course wrap uh, course wrap, corpse rack maus mausoleum. However, the ballista's base is too big, so he cannot go through there. Okay, so that's that. 
So very handy stuff. This will obviously get filed uh, with our other tutorial stuff. Okay, now what have we got? The Evocator or Evocator, please tell me. Their War Scroll. So three wounds, a move of five, saves on four up and a bravery of eight. So what have we got? Melee weapons, Tempest Blade and Storm Stave. It's a one inch range with four attacks. Three ups all the way, hits and wounds. Rend minus one and deals one damage. The Evocator Prime, which is the leader, add one to the attacks characteristic of an Ev Evocator Prime's melee weapons. <clears throat> and let's look at the abilities before we move on to the Jedside Paradons. Okay, so Evocator Prime, there you go, one extra for attacks. Now, Celestial Lightning Arc. The Evocator's weapons are surrounded by electrical energy, which helps defect, which helps defect missile attacks and can damage nearby units. So on saving rolls, you can add it to your saving rolls. Um, the Evocators are being attacked by the Briar Queen's Rending Scream, which is a missile weapon. When making their saves against it, the Evocators will be able to reroll any save rolls of one. So it's a reroll of ones. And then on Mortal Wounds, so you get both of these actually. After resolving the Evocator's attacks, Celestial Lightning Arc can inflict mortal wounds on a nearby unit. The Evocators have attacked the Grimgast Reapers. The Reapers are within the Reapers and Glaive Wraiths are both within three inches. The Stormcast player picks the Glaive Wraith Stalkers as the target of Celestial Lightning Arc. They roll two dice for each Evocator in the unit. For each score of a four up, the Stalkers will suffer one mortal wound. Okay, very cool. And then we've got the Empower ability. If cast, Empower allows the Evocators to pick a friendly unit wholly within 12 inches. This unit may reroll fa failed to wound rolls until their next hero phase. This can only be used on units with the Redeemer or Sacrosanct keywords in their War Scrolls. Okay, so that's another really good one. What have we got now? Dread Scythe Harrens. So one wound each, the movement of eight, saves on a four up and a bravery of 10. So what we've got, scythed limbs, one inch range, three attacks, hits on fours and wounds on three, rend minus one, and just one damage. Now the slasher crone, who you can see in this little picture here, uh, this is the leader, add one to the attacks characteristics of her scythed limbs. It's also a flying unit. Okay, so let's look at the abilities on this page. So we know, slash a crone, one extra dice. Howling Shriek. This ability causes all models within three inches of the Dreadside Harridans to subtract one from their to hit rolls. Unless they have a bravery characteristic of six or more. This ability is unlikely to affect Stormcast Eternals due to their higher bravery, ca bravery characteristics, but it can affect models from other factions in Warhammer, say Age of Sigmar. So for example, here's a guy from the Free Guild Guard who's got a bravery of just five. So he will minus one to his hit rolls. And then we've got Murderous Bloodra, the blood, <clears throat> Murderous Bloodlust. Whenever a Dreadside Harridan rolls an unmodified six to wound, that, attacks ha uh, that attack has a damage characteristic of two instead of one. Make sure you keep track of how many wound rolls you score of six you score. Your opponent needs to make save rolls for these attacks separately so you can both keep track of the damage that needs to be allocated. Okay, very good. Okay, now we get to our battle plan where we are adding our terrain. Lifting the curse. Xandria Azurebolt swept aside another trailing curse of vines with her staff. The forest with the forest was thick here, yet it was still quiet. Life seemed to have fled the woodland, leaving only silence. In her wake trailed Evocator Prime Aether Spark, his Tempest Blade and Storm Shave, his Tempest Blade and Storm Stave readied. Anastasia Starstrike and her sequitors marched ahead of them, swatting the foliage aside with their maces. Okay, so we add our terrain. Um, this large ruin is placed near the Nighthorn player's territory. Models will be able to hide behind it or within it. If models can draw a line of sight through the windows or door, they may still be able to shoot at models sheltered, in, sheltered, in, sheltered inside though. 
the small ruined wall so that the, so this piece goes near the center of the mat it will not provide much cover but may slow models down and then this small piece of rubble goes near the stormcast players territory it will have no effects in your games other than looking great nice okay and then a brief look at the battle plan um which we'll come back to in a later battle report. We have got the Sequitors, Xandria Azure Bolt, and the Evocator Prime up against the Thorns of the Briar Queen and the Briar Queen, and five Dread Scythe Harridans. You can see here where our terrain goes, the large piece here next to the Nighthaunt, our small useless piece, which makes no difference here, and then the little wall here. And that's that. So very good. So this is a glorious victory. So the game ends when one player has no models left. Stormcast Eternals go first. But that's good. So what have we got the next two weeks? Very exciting stuff. So we have got the Curse Breakers, Storm Size Curse Breakers, which are models from the Underworlds game. So that's very good. And then issue 28, we get three Spirit Hosts, which is great for my Warcry collection because I don't have these models yet. So brilliant, three of them as well. So that's some real good value in these kits coming up next couple of weeks. So that's it. I think it's a solid issue to be fair. Um, love the terrain and I love the fact that, that it is different to my Warcry stuff. So that is a big plus for me. Our next set of terrain, I believe will be in issue 30. So I've got another video that I'll be uploading in the next few days, which goes through mainly all of the covers right up to about issue 36. Um, so I'll do a recap on what we've received so far, and then I'll do all of these front covers as they go forward to issue. I believe, I believe I've got photos of up to 36. So we'll be able to see for, for around about the next 10 issues or so what we're going to be receiving. So that's it. Thanks for watching, guys. Much appreciated. I hope you enjoyed that, and I hope you are enjoying Mortal Realms. We're getting some more terrain soon, but this is brilliant to keep us going for now. So, yeah, I will see you very soon. Catch you later.